Not all X-Men villains get as much hype as they deserve. Join me today as we shine the spotlight on some lesser celebrated villains as we count down the top 10 X-Men villains more powerful than you think. Number 10, Vanisher. An old school villain who also almost single handedly defeated the X-Men back in the day. Almost. So close. Well actually he kind of did defeat the X-Men team, but fortunately Professor X butt in to save the day. And he was only able to defeat Vanisher by wiping his mind and making him forget who he was. And what he was capable of, which I think goes to show just how powerful of a villain he is. He was the first teleporter the team really encountered, proving just how crazy powerful teleporters are. Vanisher is also considered to be a super fast teleporter, and his power limits thus far has been pretty much undefined, even when he did resurface years later. I would consider him to be at a higher level though, just based on what I've seen thus far. He also was able to teleport himself safely just instinctually, even when teleporting to a place he's never seen or been to before, avoiding teleporting teleporting partially or fully into any solid objects, which of course could kill him. And which is like a great danger if you're a teleporter. <laughs> you just teleport somewhere and now part of you's in a car and you're like, well, I guess I'm dead now. That's it. Number nine, Living Diamond. Okay, so someone I also think we need to talk about who needs some kind of redemption in the comics is Jack Winters, aka Jack O Diamonds or Living Diamond. He was one of the first X-Men villains whom Professor X saved Scott Summers from, thereby recruiting him to his X Men team. Living Diamond's mutant power was believed to be radiation resistance, but he was also shown to be able to teleport short distances, had telepathy, and had a diamond form. Does that sound familiar at all? Telepathy with a diamond form. Hmm. Somehow, Living Diamond was way too easily defeated by a vibration beam which shattered him. I know Living Diamond is dead now and was undead at one point, but I really feel like considering how OP Emma Frost has become, Living Diamond should also get a second chance to prove just how powerful he, in theory, should be. I mean, if you got all that, how were you so easily defeated? And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about the unexpected yet powerful villains that we don't usually get to talk about, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Arcade. Arcade is one of those villains who feels super ridiculous with his grandiose plans for murder world. But in reality, when he actually manages to achieve plots like Murder World, he's actually quite scary. I mean, getting a sneak peek into just what a ludicrous and horrifying operation he'd run in Hellions really made me appreciate just how dangerous Arcade can be if he does manage to get enough hostages, that is, to control people into working with him so he can create his Murder World. In Hellions number 9, it's revealed that the trap Mastermind walked the Hellions and prior to that Mr. Sinister into was a trap laid by Arcade himself. <gasps> Gasp, what a reveal. Arcade's plan was to use Sinister's Hellions as leverage to encourage Sinister to work for him. Sinister didn't really seem to actually care about the Hellions, and he basically just agreed outright, although Arcade still chose to forcefully remove some of his teeth for fun before putting him to work. He wanted Sinister to make clones for him for Murder World, and had his plan worked, it would have been a real horror show. However, Sinister made a counteroffer to Mastermind, and instead the two double-crossed Arcade. Still, that whole like three issues issue arc made me believe in the power of Arcade. Like, if he has the right allies, he could be really crazy. I'm here for like some sort of plot where Arcade tries to just turn the world into murder world or something. I, if that hasn't happened yet, someone write that for me, please. Maybe I should write that down. Maybe I should write that. I don't know. Marvel, call me. I got ideas, apparently. Number seven, The Blob. The Blob is a villain that we don't often get to talk about on these supervillain lists. He tends to fall by the wayside, but truly, he's pretty unstoppable. And when he puts his mind to something, or when he puts his body to something, he's a terribly tough villain to defend feet or even move. The Blob was one of the first villains to appear in the original X-Men series, and when he did, he gave the team of youngsters a really tough time. He also attacked them with a circus. The Blob actually didn't start out as a villain, but became one due to the influence of Professor X and the X-Men themselves. Also just thinking back and like the amount of times that the X-Men have fought circuses or been trapped in circuses or that happens a lot. That's like a recurring theme. Initially, the X-Men attempted to recruit the Blob, but after the Blob refused to accept their offer, he managed to escape before Xavier could wipe his mind of their identities. This caused problems later on down the road, but really it was how the X-Men treated him after he refused to join and kind of his own self-esteem and then later his overcompensating sense of superiority that turned him into a villain. I like I wonder if the Blob actually could have been an ally if this whole scenario 
Mario had just gone a little bit differently. The blob is super strong, durable, and virtually immovable thanks to his ability to manipulate gravitational mass, which is pretty powerful. He also later gained a secondary mutation which gave him a liquid form, but he hasn't really exhibited a ton of control with his secondary power set. But he also has liquid form. That's on the resume of powers now. Number 6. Red Death Also known as Kandra, Red Death currently has a very Scarlet Witch looking vibe going on, and I gotta say, I'm feeling it. And just like Scarlet Witch, she is not someone who you should underestimate. Kandra is part of the externals, and while she isn't one of the most memorable of that mutant villain team, she is still someone who is super powerful. Technically, just being an external comes with a pretty big dose of power. The externals, not to be confused with Marvel's Eternals, a different team entirely, are a group of immortal mutants, basically. They have had various roles throughout history. One more prominent one that folks might remember Kandra from is her role as benefactress. When we learned of her history with Gambit and the Thieves and Assassins guilds of New Orleans during Gambit's miniseries. In fact, that was actually where Kandra first was introduced in the comics, making her initial appearance in Gambit issue number one from the 1993 miniseries. Although the way they approach that introduction, you wouldn't necessarily maybe know that that was her first appearance because she kind of shows up like, hey, you know me, I'm Kandra. And I'm like, do we know you? Who are you? But it's alright, she's pretty powerful. Number 5. Moira X Moira was at one point powerful enough to have almost successfully wiped out all mutants. If it weren't for Mystique and Destiny, she would have succeeded. Even though she claimed during that past life that she only intended to create a cure to offer it to those who wanted it, Destiny knew that any mutant cure would essentially become weaponized and then forced on mutants, regardless of their own wants and desires. For those who haven't been reading along recently with the event of the current X-Men line of comics, it was revealed that Moira herself was actually a mutant whose powers were basically reincarnation in her own form. Basically she dies and then she comes back to life as like a baby and lives her life again. But when Moira dies, she ends up being reborn as herself, but with all the memories of that past life. As such, Moira wasn't just a dangerous potential villain for the X-Men, but kind of the whole of 616, which also seems to be tied to Moira's current life, which I believe is her 10th life. Pretty crazy stuff. Moira is no longer a mutant after being cured in the 2021 Inferno series when Mystique shot her with a gun of Forge's design which basically turns mutants into humans. But she still is a dangerous woman with a lot of information. And it was heavily implied that the creation of Krokoa was kind of all about eventually ridding the world of mutants over time. With Krokoa being like their last hurrah in terms of Moira's plan. Time will tell if Moira becomes more villainous but I wouldn't be surprised if she did just based on where she was heading in this story. And when or if that does happen, you better watch out. Danger is the Danger Room. The Danger Room is a villain who surfaced because they were basically being mistreated by Professor Rex, who had decided to ignore the fact that the Training Room had become sentient and was itself a technologically based mutant. Eventually, Danger decided, enough of this sh**. It's time to get some sweet, sweet revenge. The crazy thing about Danger is although we don't think of her too much, she really would be a pretty strong opponent to the X-Men considering she trained them and as such would know their strengths and weaknesses. In fact, I think that even is mentioned in the comics at one point. She was also considered to be an extinction level threat that caused Steve Rogers great worry in Heroic Age X-Men, which is kind of like a glimpse into his like tactical commentary diary. So if you wanted to read that, it exists. So despite not thinking about Danger too much, we all probably should in case she ever decides to, you know, go the villain route again. Destroy everyone, because she could probably do that. Extinction level, friends. Number 3. Mystique Mystique is someone who isn't particularly or at least outwardly powerful when it comes to what she's capable of or her power set, and for this reason, many people have taken to underestimating her abilities. Here's why we'd advise against that. Inferno, issue number 4. In the newest Inferno series, it's revealed that while Mystique tried to play by Krakoa's rules, when she learned she wasn't going to get what she wanted from Magneto and Professor Rex, no matter what she did in the name of the mutant nation, she decided to take matters into her own hands. As Mystique so often does. Disguising herself as many different people, she was able to easily ensure that Destiny was resurrected, against the wishes of the heads of the Quiet Council. She also put into motion plans to make sure that Destiny would garner a spot on the Quiet Council. And then, she almost was successful in enacting revenge on Moira X for keeping her love, Destiny, from her. Mystique here proves that not only is her power set OP, but really that her mind and sense of cunning is what makes her 
are so dangerous and definitely not someone to be underestimated. Number two, Destiny. Destiny has to be one of the most underestimated villains in recent years in comics. We have seen her resurface as a considerably dangerous villain in the current X books, and I'm personally loving it. Destiny was dead for quite a few years and actually got to mostly stay dead for much of them. Her mutant power allows her to see potential futures. She can see things that might come to pass, and it seems as though the more likely the future becomes, the clearer her vision of it is. She can also see more immediate futures when in the middle of a conflict. It was because of this power and Moira's personal grudge against and fear of destiny that she remained unresurrected. But something you really shouldn't underestimate when it comes to destiny is the power of love. Mystique was already told by destiny before her death that if there came a time when mutants could be resurrected and they refused to bring her back, that Mystique should basically burn this new world to the ground. And Mystique's love of destiny gave her the motivation to basically bring Krakoa to its knees with her machinations to not only return destiny, but also put her in a position of power. Precogs and love are a powerful mix. Number one, Madeline Pryor. Of course, I have to include the Goblin Queen. Madeline Pryor is a woman who seems to easily be forgotten and shelved, which is surprising considering how great of a threat she posed in the original Inferno event. Currently in the comics, Madeline Pryor is making a comeback, returning at the end of the Hellion series after being killed as part of the comic's first arc. The Madeline Pryor that was killed was definitely feeling pretty evil and threatened to destroy the entire Hellions team before they even started. The returning Madeline, who has been resurrected by the Five, is at least putting on appearances that she's more level-headed. But in reality, it seems the dark side of her still bubbles just beneath. Madeline Pryor has threatened the entire world with her dark rituals and demon packs before, and she's a clone of Jean, so although she often gets forgotten and downplayed, she really shouldn't be considering just how dangerous and powerful she is because Jean is also that and Maddie is also that too. She has the potential at least. Often people try to downplay Maddie because she's a sinister created clone, but that feels very unfair. She's also got like a spark of the Phoenix Force in her, so should that count for something? I think so. Which villains do you think deserve the most fear and respect? Which lesser known villains would you love to see make a comeback? How do you feel about the new status quo with many villains and heroes living in more of a gray area of harmony? Let us know in the comments below. This has been Top 10 Nerd and I'm your host Amanda McKnight. Till next time, you stay nerdy YouTube.